we believe, you know, methods, tools, environments, and relationships. And I'm really going to focus today on the relationships part of Meteor. So we're going to connect a few dots for you today. Um, our essential question for the day is we're going to talk about today's learner. We're going to figure out who they are and how and why that engagement is different than it used to be. And then again, how can design support that? So I want to start you guys. You know, Zoom calls and uh, today's environment definitely are a challenge, aren't they? Um, so that would be Albert. That would be my wonderful 110 pound dog that you guys got to introduce to. So tell me either in chat or unmute, tell me every characteristic. What can you think of about today's kiddos? Tell me some characteristics about them. So holler in the chat and um, let's talk about today's kids. What do we know about today's kids? Digital learners, absolutely. What else? Entrepreneurial, 100%. Kyle, Joe, Craig, what do you guys think? We've got, oh, I, I'm not afraid to call on people either. So, well, let's, you know what? We're going to keep going. Let's keep this rocking and roll. Oh, I love, thank you, Joe. I appreciate it. Love seeking content. Oh, man, absolutely. And they, Craig, you are correct. They absolutely want to know it now. It is all about today. And they, you should have given them the answer 10 minutes ago and read their minds, right? So, you know, furniture is not a new thing. And again, as a teacher, I want, you know, I always have to bring reading into it. Um, so if you look back, even way back in 1937, when Laura Ingalls Wilder talked about um, school in her books, she actually talked about furniture. She talked about long benches. She talked about, you know, how the shelf was mounted on the back of the other seat and how when you're ready to move, all you did was move back a bench. You know, this furniture was very heavy. It was very, you know, cumbersome, was not really moved for anything. Even church, when they would go in from, you know, school on Friday and church on Sunday, it would be the same exact setup. So let's take a look. What do you notice about this picture? This is a one-room schoolhouse, you know. Um, what do you see for these kids? Juan, what do you think? What do you notice about this picture? I'm just curious. Craig, any? Oh, absolutely. Not collaborative, rigid, 100%. You know, this morning, I actually had one of our, our crew say, look at their hands. They were primed even back then for digital technology. They were primed to have that phone in their hands because of the way they were sitting. And Craig, you are so right. Learning was on your own. There's a really big misconception about this type of environment that it's a very controlled, that they are, um, they're, they're, man, they're, they're in, attentive. They're, they're listening. Definitely not true because look at what happens even now. Same type of environment little bit of a different style. If you notice in here, they've, they've all got one-to-one -one technology. Now, technology is not a bad thing. I like it, but really, you know, what's different? I always like to call these cemetery rows myself as a retired principal, because if you notice, those kiddos are no more engaged than this. And if anything, they actually look like they're less engaged, don't they? Why, how can we start moving to this? How can we really get kids to where they're leaning in? They're looking at, you know, what can we, what can we grab on? What knowledge can we, can we grab? So I want you to be thinking of a couple of things as you kind of go, and you might want to even jot this down for yourself somewhere on a piece of paper. I want you to be thinking at all times, teachers and kids, what is, what does learning look like in the classroom? What are they doing? What are students doing? What are this, what is the teacher doing? When you walk in, what does it sound like? What, you know, what do you hear and whose voice in particular do you hear the most? And then what does it feel like when you walk into a building, when you walk into a classroom? And I would encourage you, I like to start a conversation off with a district with these questions. What do you want? What do you have now? And what do you envision for the future? Who do you want to be hearing most? Whoever's voice you hear the most is the one that's doing the most learning. 
So I want you to be thinking about that as we go through this. And when you think about engagement and how these kids are working, you know, Gallup, if you're not familiar with Gallup, they're a great organization that studies a lot on engagement. And a few years ago, they did a great survey and looked at really what happens with engagement as kids go through their school years. And there are three categories. You can be engaged, which we all know what that means. You can be not engaged or disengaged. That means you're kind of in the middle, you know, you're just kind of hanging in the middle of the boat, you know, in the front of the boat, you're up there paddling. In the middle of the boat, you're kind of just hanging out. You're letting the front people do their thing. Then there's the back of the boat people. That's the actively disengaged. Those are the people who are drilling the hole in the back of the boat. They're really actually hurting their learning at that point. So if you notice, as we go through school, it goes from very few kids disengaged to 66% either disengaged or actively disengaged. I don't know about you guys. How many of you have kids at home? Absolutely. You know, I still have one at home and that's scary to me because as they get older, you think about that next step. They're either going to go off to work. They're going to go off to a trade school. They're going to go off to college and they're so disengaged with school that really impedes their learning at this point. So we kind of want to watch that and, and you guys are going to be the greatest help that we can, you know, that we can bring to a school. Um, I think it's always important before we talk about today's kids to take a look at ourselves. What did the people before us, or what did they used to say about us? So you start off in the United States, we started way back with the GI generation in about 1905, really looking at generations and what characteristics, you know, they turn over about every 10-ish years. Um, so we started kind of taking a look at what are those characteristics? What was the change before? I really want you to pay attention to that column that says change before the generation before. And then, you know, what happens and, and what are their focus? So, of course, we had the GI generation who was in World War II. Um, then we go on to the silent generation. And that was really where that first Great Depression happened. But they were very big conformists. If you think about what happened during the Great Depression, soup lines, you know, they really, they had that civic interest. They wanted to make sure that they were trying to do the greatest good for all of their communities. They were helping one another. Well, then out of that came the baby boomers. Look at what happened. We increased 18 million people. Well, when you do that, you've got a demand for housing, for food, you know, all of this industry that increases. You know, this was the me generation. They were very, very anti-war, very highly loyal to their kiddos. I want you to think what happened. Look at those birth years. So if you think about it, those kiddos started to become adults or teenagers during the 1950s and 60s. What was going on when you think of music? What did that silent generation say about baby boomers? You know, you had Elvis Presley who came on the stage and who that was holy smoke sinful. I don't know. I'm sure you guys know they only videoed him and put him on live TV from the waist up because they were scared of his, you know, moving and shaking, right? So that generation before really thought, oh man, I know my dad was like, you know, he had to have his hair cut a certain way, had to come to school a certain way. Girls had to wear dresses. My mom used to say all the time that she had to actually kneel in, in the school if they thought her dress was too short, if it didn't touch the ground, her parents were called and she had to go change. You know, so that when people started rolling up their pants and rolling up their sleeves and letting their hair grow long, whew, that silent generation didn't really like that. Then you had those of us who are Gen Xers come along. Gen X means nothing more than just that we were the 10th generation. But again, look what happened to the numbers that dropped down 22 million from the prior generation. We had VCRs, MTV. You know, put a, put a yes in that chat if you grew up and said, I want my MTV. Say, 
come on, I want to see those Gen Xers holler out there. Absolutely. Oh, see, Emily, I knew you were one of us. You know, those, those Emily, oh, awesome, Craig. It's, you know, we were the first group of kiddos who were latchkey kids. You know, we are also the most highly educated. We are also the only generation before COVID who saw three, now four with COVID, economic downturns in our lifetime. Wow, we are a resilient bunch of kids, right? You know, then what did baby boomers say about Gen Xers? Holler out there. If you're a Gen Xer, come on, Craig, what did your parents and grandparents say about you? You know, Emily, did anybody tell you guys you were lazy? Slackers, Joe. Oh, I love that. I didn't hear that in my last one. That's perfect. You know, we all wanted to be Tony Hawk, right? Well, you know, we were all skaters. Scared we were not going to make it. Oh, that, <laughs> that is so true, Craig. That is so true. You know, then we had, we started having kids and baby boomers had some kiddos later and we got Gen Y. We had very scheduled kids. Look at that again, that bump in that, um, that group of kids, 23 million raised. They were very heavily scheduled, very much want to write the world. They, they want to make sure that, that people are doing the things that they, you know, they can. They were the ones that started discovering problems with plastics, with straws. I remember growing up, I grew up in California on an Air Force base. And I remember, you know, the big focus was on um, cutting things like the little plastic from the, all the soda pop cans, you know, so it wouldn't hurt things in the ocean. They were the largest generation in U.S. history. Very flexible, very autonomous. Um, oh, I love that, Craig. Yep. Change jobs like I change my clothes. <laughs> Absolutely. And millennials, Gen Y, we need to not be afraid of that because they do change their job quite often, even more so than Gen X did. And I loved when I started my, you know, got a chance to start this studio here in the Four Corners. Um, one of my, my Gen Yers came up at the middle of the thing and said, please don't call us a millennial. You know, that's kind of used as a down, talking down to this group, right? It's kind of almost a cuss word. Um, so then we've got today's kids. So starting at about 96, 97, 98, somewhere around there, this new group of kiddos came along. So what do they bring to us? And I think, you know, this first one has always been the most important to me as a parent of three kiddos. I've got two adult kids and I've still got a 14 year old at home. And um, this one to me is the most important. They live in a world, and especially now, that doesn't feel safe to them. You know, I, I love telling the story that when my daughter turned, got ready to turn 13, I said, honey, what's, what are you most excited about? And she said, mom, can't wait to do this. I said, honey, what, what do you mean? And of course, what do you get? Teenage girl, you get the eye rolling in the, mom, don't you understand? I just want to do this. I said, well, honey, what? I don't understand. She goes, mom, when we go to the airport, I want to go in the big machine. I can't wait to go in the big, the big screening machine. And that really makes me sad because I remember the days of being able to walk straight to the gate, being able to go and shoot. You could take a whole two liter bottle of soda and nobody would even care. You know, um, so the world now, and you'll notice that, that kids today are really asking a lot of questions. They want to know. They want to know why. Um, you guys nailed it. They are digital natives. They, believe it or not, they are, they are doing some predictions that kids are on their, digi or their digital devices 70% of the time during school. That's the newest estimate. Now, of course, look at us now with COVID, they're on there all the time. You know, they're born with an iPad. I'm sure that you guys have, those of you with small kids or, or kids that have grown up as a Gen Zer, they knew how to work electronics and they know touch pads and everything before they can even really read a book. They really do. Somebody said um, lower attention span. Absolutely correct. Eight seconds versus 12 for Gen Y. 
That's, that's really not, that's not a lot. They can switch from work to play. They know and appreciate independence as kiddos. This can often look like a challenger. You know, they, they are asking the why. They want to know that. They are very entrepreneurial. Right now, 13% is estimated during, of all the Gen Z kids that they already own their own business before they exit middle school and high school. 76% of these kiddos right now want to create a job from their hobby. So toss in there. I'd love to, to either take yourself off mute or throw it in the chat. What do you think the biggest um, job that these kiddos want? And let me look, take a look at Craig. He says, watching digital learning has been amazing in our district. Absolutely. Oh my gosh, Craig, you're so right. I've got a great friend whose child is actually teaching his teacher how to work the technology. And he's 14. And I love this, guys. You got entertainment, influencers, coding. You know, you guys are so on. Last year, oh, self-employment one. Oh, that's a good one. That's a good one. I've actually never had anybody say that one. That's a great, great guess. Last year, I would have told you that kids last year, number one job, they wanted to be a YouTuber. This year, they want to be influencers. So for those of you who don't know what an influencer is, um, an influencer is a person who gets on social media and they say, oh, this is my favorite coffee. I drink only this. And that's what an influencer is because then they get paid for promoting products. So that's the number one job right now. I don't know about you guys. I would not want to get out of the shower, put this curl stuff in my hair and then show everybody, oh, this is my favorite curl stuff. Kind of private that way. Um, they love, like I said, individuality. They, they're thinkers. They want to know that why. You're probably, if you have kids at home, you're probably hearing that question a lot right now. Through all this COVID stuff, here asking why. Why can't we go out? Why do I have to wear a mask? You know, why are people nervous? Why can't I go get my haircut? Why can't I go to the park? My little eight-year-old nephew is so sad because he can't go to the park and see his friends. Um, they want to know this. They are very transparent. They don't have any time for people who, who are not authentic in their lives. They really want people to be real with them. We've got to be really careful right now because, you know, of course, realism, depending on, you know, what their age is, we've got to be kind of careful. So thinking, thinking of the future for these guys. This is why you guys play such a huge part. Kids are going to have as many as 40 jobs in 10 different careers is what the estimate is right now. That is exactly like someone said earlier, it's changing, I think Craig said that, changing jobs like you change your clothes. You know, that's going to be important because it's going to take retooling. You know, there are jobs we don't even know exist today. So when you're planning and when you're talking to districts about what they want this building to either refab or they want, you know, this new building, we don't know how to plan for 15, 20 years down the future in the future. So we've got to make sure that we're paying attention to that. I would recommend if you guys have not been on the World Economic Forum's website, it's definitely a place. Those of you who are geeky like me, um, I could spend hours and hours on that website. Well, they come out with lists about every five years of skill sets that kids need to be prepared to go out into the world. When they graduate school, they need to go out. I want you to take a look for just a second and pop it in the chat again, unmute, whatever you'd like. And I'd like to hear what you notice between 2015 and 2022. Take a look at those skills. You know, what do you notice is on the list is not on the list. Um, what's, what do you think about those skills? Holler in that chat and see, tell me a little bit about maybe what you observe. Creativity, absolutely. Oh, Dan and I cannot agree with you more. That, it, believe it or not, it actually did drop off the list for a few years, um, but I'm, I was glad to see you in 2015 when it came back. People management, absolutely. What else do you notice? Do you notice in there that there's not something like 
learning how to do, or you have to know how to do quadratic equations. You have to know history timelines. You have to know all this. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to challenge you. And I, I would encourage you to challenge all of your neighbors. There's a difference between me asking you, who can name right now as fast as you can without using any devices, presidents 11, 12, 13, 14. That would be hard. Most people can't do that. But if I said to you, use any device you can um, and tell me what those are. And then I want to challenge you to pick out of those five presidents who made the biggest impact and why and how. That is a huge skill set difference, massive skill set difference. That's what we need to be looking at. It's not about the stuff that we're learning, but how we acquire knowledge. How can we problem solve? How can we analyze? So then I want, I want you to think about when you're working with clients, kind of feeling out where they are now and where they want to go. So are they a traditional school? Do they do some career in tech ed? Do they um, do a lot of thinking and learning in those schools? Um, you know, are they a blended environment? You know, are they wanting to do that more on a full-time basis? Parents don't want kids who just come out uh, just about the grades. They want kids who are engaged. So I want you to think about three types of engagement that you guys can help with. Relational engagement, connections between people, social networks. Now, I understand that it's going to look a little different maybe in the fall. But I want us to think about also cognitive engagement. How much... Um, how much personal effort is done um, during this time? How much, um, how much time do kids learn with that um, environment? How much time do they get a um, task assigned to them? And, um, you know, what, what, can they, what can we do to encourage that? Then the next one I want you to think about is the most important, Act, agentic engagement. Agentic engagement is personally personal actions that kids take for themselves and, and being really that, you know, that pusher of knowledge. I want, I want to learn, you know, how can I learn for myself? And I want you to take a look at these. How is this so different than that first picture? You know, we want kids who are actively engaged, who are really looking like they're leaning in, they're happy and excited. The top left picture happens to be my most favorite picture that we have. I think that just, you know, that's what I want kids to do. I want you all to take a look, though, in the top right hand corner, the little guy with the glasses. Watch for him. He's going to be president one day. He's a pretty great little guy. So what can you guys do? The brain needs five different things that I want you to think about. I want you to think about behaviorally relevant input. They have to get, kids have to get buy-in. Your brain needs buy-in. They need fun, novel ways to learn. They need rewarded input. They need that, that positive cue. So again, if I'm sitting in straight rows, it's hard for a teacher unless they're moving around. They really, it's hard to get back to a kid. They need strong, intense input. And then the brain needs that, rep that repetition. So yeah, you might be thinking to yourself, what am I going to do as an architect? There are ways that you can take that environment and either hinder or help. So again, all those things like great light, things like that. But I want you to take a look at this little picture and keep, a, keep this in mind as you, as you design. There are certain areas that you can kind of start to encourage in um, classrooms, in buildings. And they don't have to, you know, every district has a little name to call them, of course. But I want you to be mainly thinking about what ways can I look at these pictures? What works? What doesn't work? I want you to take a look back at this first picture. What do you notice? What is this classroom doing that can help and not hinder learning? Shoot that in the, and put that in that text, in that chat, and... Um, Holler at me. What do you see? Lots of zones. Absolutely. Various seating. Love it, Joe. Absolutely. 
not always individual, right, Joe? You got you know some group work, some pairing, um, things like that. Do you notice? Um, do you notice some ability to have a soft seat? Chairs on wheels, absolutely, Sharon. Hundred percent, hundred percent. What else? What else do you notice? Oh, somebody else. Come on. What else do you notice? Well, let's look at let's look at some of these. As you start to see, oh, I love Emily. Yes, no big teacher desk. Different heights. Doesn't feel cramped. You know. I've got it. Oh, I love Joe that you picked that out. I was actually just going to say that there is no front of the classroom. We have a saying in education that says sage on the stage or guide on the side. And I want you all to be thinking about being a guide. You know, I personally, I, I jokingly with my team always talk about the fact that I'd love to rid the world of those ginormous teacher's desks. When I first started teaching my very first classroom, I walk in the door the first day and I literally have a very, very large um, desk from, oh gosh, it had to have been like 1950s era, you know, metal desk that I couldn't even move as a 22-year-old teacher. Um, and it took up literally like a quarter. Oh, I love tank desks. Yes, that is, <laughs> that's a great way to describe it. You know, take a look. You've got individuals. You've got groups. I love this picture. Look at how the kids are leaning in. When you lean into something, that means you're engaged with it. It's one of those signs that we look for as a teacher. The teacher coming to the kids. The kids are standing. They're sitting on different types of seating. The room is very flexible. You know, one thing when you think of COVID, you're going to need that flexibility, right? You're going to need the ability to either put six feet between. Oh, I love Craig. I love that. It's absolutely what all coaches do. hundred um, percent. You know, we, we're going to need to be thinking about what does it mean in a post COVID world? You know, I want to just give you a couple little definitions real quick. Um, crisis means two things. It means definitely a time of intense difficulty, trouble, danger, um, but it also means a time when difficult or important decisions are going to be made. So you guys right now are going to be challenged. You're going to have districts and teachers who are worried about our babies, about our little guys. And they're going to worry because they're going to worry. Do kids have, are they going to come back and believe that they can do this school stuff? Are they going to worry about sickness? Um, am I going to worry about sickness? Am I, as a teacher, am I going to worry about getting sick or causing someone else to get sick. So when you think of this, you, you have to be able to do what Bandura, who's a, a great psychologist, he, he has a social learning theory that says your individual belief interacts with your environment and your behaviors. And, uh, you know, you're going to really, really have to pay attention to all of that. And when you pay attention in the environment itself, there are only a few ways that you can increase someone's belief. You can have mastery experiences, having successes. You can have vicarious exp experiences where you're observing. So think about what distancing will do to that. You know, we're going to have to observe in different ways. You're going to have, of course, the feedback that you get from your teachers, which is, again, could be a little hard if we're doing some alternative scheduling, some distancing, some, you know, some technology schooling, um, emotional state. So again, in those environments, we're going to have to continue to pay attention to what, how we can build that positive emotional state. And then, um, you know, we've got the, the visualization. So if you definitely, like Craig said, if you're a coach, if you are um, an athlete of any kind, you know, the visualization techniques are huge. So what can you guys do? When you're thinking of all these things and all this stress and all this stuff that's coming around, what I want to encourage you is, don't, is stay the course. Stay the course on that flexible environment. Stay the course. I would hate to see us going back to individual seats. You know, for the time being, we might have to distance ourselves. We might have to put some dividers up, some sneeze guards, you know, things like that. 
But when you're designing, I want you to think of proximity. Where is the teacher in relationship to students? How can I increase that relationship and include people to where they're not just on an island by themselves, maybe temporary, post-COVID? Got some choice again on products, you know, that they're doing in the classroom plus all of the um, content and things like that. And how can I encourage success and production of language? Also keeping in mind those hard things like the technology. How can I support technology and make sure that um, they have supportive, you know, outlets? They've got um, enough technology that they have um, flexibility to be able to learn and support that learning inside and outside the classroom with technology. That you do have the safety and security, of course. Got that open design, that transparent design. Then you've got multi-purpose spaces. So again, thinking post-COVID, you know, we want to have spaces that can be flexible enough for now where we can do those things, but also in five years, we don't know what um, schools are going to need. We don't know what careers are going to be around. And then, of course, that outdoor learning. I'm such a big proponent of getting kids into different spaces. Um, you're so right, Craig. I do want, I mean, tech is a huge challenge when you're updating those older schools. You're so correct. I think a lot of times that's when I would encourage you to create a set of questions that asks directly and upfront about those things, because if they don't have that planned and they don't have that technology money planned, that's going to be very difficult, very difficult going forward. Um, so definitely you want to make sure that you're you're kind of taking some of these things and putting those in that discovery session with that district to find out what do they really want? What are they really thinking? And then when you're suggesting that helps them decide on budget, that helps them really plan and look ahead as to what can I do? What can I, you know, help provide? Because I think oftentimes I'm sure um, I'm you know, preaching to the choir when I say that oftentimes we're dealing with a budget that maybe somebody didn't think of all those things. So they've already passed their bond. They've already passed, you know, they've already got their, bu their budget done. And then we're coming in to take care of that. Anybody, anybody ever dealt with that? <laughs> and Emily, you're all right. Absolutely. Having the IT director in the planning Having, you know, having lots of people in the planning, you want to make sure that you've got a wide variety of people. Um, and then, you know, as you go forward, just again, be willing to ask, be willing to talk about what can, you know, what do they really want? Because what you'll find is so often you've got teachers and administrators who are wonderfully intended. They've got, oh, the most amazing wants for their kiddos, but they just don't know what they don't know. Um, and that's really our job to ask those questions. So I'm going to leave you some time here. I'd love um, to just kind of open it up for some questions. You know, if you've got any questions, we'd love to hear them. Um, take, feel free, take yourself off and mute and um, feel free to ask away. Anybody have any questions? I just got a one question sent that asked, you know, how do you um, deal with those those objections when you've got? Sue Ann, we're having a little bit of a problem with your audio. We oh. can't hear you. All right, let me let me see if I can move. We had a problem with my dogs barking too much, so let's see how's that. Is that a little better? It's, it's the joys of working from home. I know. All these new challenges, early. right? All these yeah. new challenges. Um, and have you noticed the dogs only bark when you're on a Zoom call? Only when I'm on Zoom. <laughs> only. Um, so let me, let me deal with the objection question real quick first. You're going, you possibly will have some objections. And what you need to do is just really, I believe it's a lot about that inquiry and getting people to think and talk. Because the more that they really start talking, the more you can really dig in um, and 
again, the more people you have at the table, like Emily said, the more different viewpoints. We um, often will do something where we bring in a whole bunch of people to the table, both operations side and also the teachers and the educational leaders. And they see things in different ways. You know, you'll have the head of facilities asking those questions like, I need floor outlets, I need this. Well, if that space, you know, if that's going to cause a ton more money when it comes to um, all of the construction, that definitely puts a dent in it. Um, so again, having the more people, the better. And then, um, of course, uh, Char Charlene, absolutely. And then Mike, do you have recommendations on the minimum area per student? Oh, goodness. That, you know what? That is a really great question. And I would tell you that um, it really depends. And the reason I say it depends, I know that that might sound like kind of a cop out, um, but it really depends on what the vision is. Because again, if I'm doing something, if I have a school that's very, very set on a very traditional environment, that takes a lot less square footage. But if you've got a district who really is focused on project-based learning, they're really focused on group work. I actually just helped one of my crew um, finish an alternative high school. Absolutely the most innovative plans I've seen in a long time. Um, these are actually very small spaces that they're dealing with, um, very 1950s, 1960s renovation kind of size, um, retrofitting an old school. But the really great thing is we got very innovative with the furniture and the spaces. And in these classrooms, there's no individual desk. They're all pairs, high tops, low tops, soft seating, um, some small laptop tables that can, kids can pull up, and even floor seating for a high school which was super wonderful. I loved seeing that. Um, and then let's see, Sharon says, I teach in an environment that is not the traditional classroom, but rather relies on the training. Oh, I love that. Any thoughts on, thoughts on how a simulation lab might evolve? You know, for Gen Z, I think really, believe it or not, I think one of the biggest things I hear about kiddos is people assume they don't want connection and interaction because of, of the technology piece. But I think that one of the labs and one of the changes that actually is gonna happen in both lab kinds of environments and simulation environments along with regular classroom is we're actually going to have to go back to teaching behaviors. So I think in a simulation lab, having the flexibility to bring and gather kids in groups to teach behavioral things like how do I work with a partner, things like that, because you're not going to just immediately be able to release them. So really making sure that you have the space for that. I think another piece, again, when it comes to a simulation lab is going to be really making sure that you do allow for flexibility in the future because we don't know the jobs. So right now in that same school that I was just telling you about, one half of the school is all the alternative high school. The other half of the school is all career and tech ed. So what they did in those rooms is we really helped them understand that you might be teaching um, HVAC right now, but in the future, that may or may not be HVAC. You know, that might be something more along the lines of tech. When they, They've also got a cyber lab. They've got um, a CNA program in there. The CNA program, we're actually allowing for that flexibility, again, not putting things down and tacking them to the floor. Um, so I would say definitely watch, you know, and have, have things that are not built in, in a simulation lab, because you're going to want to move them around for number one. And number two, making sure that that furniture and those, those pieces that are flexible can be used in other ways throughout the building. I really encourage people to not think about this is classroom furniture because that furniture may or may not need to be in that classroom later. So how can I make sure that throughout the entire design that it's, it's able to move things around? And then Craig, we're doing a CT high school with, mm, very easy to move. Oh, I love that. Oh, I love that. That is awesome, Craig. 
You know, flexibility is the name of the game these days. I think that's the one of the biggest things, again, with kids. You know, it's, it's going to be you guys encouraging people to step out of their comfort zone. Because think about this. You're dealing with teachers and administrators who have not graduated from a class that has experienced this stuff. Every one of us in this chat can probably say that we graduated from a time that was very traditional rows and columns. Um, and that, you know, that is going to take courage for that staff to try and think differently because that scares parents. You know, you guys probably hear people all the time complaining about, oh, this new math, this new math. Absolutely. Because we're really focused, again, not on the formulaic stuff, but the how-to and how, how I can come and, and create that learning. Um, I think another thing that I might say, Sharon, um, is I also might really encourage us to look at spaces that do more than one duty. So if you're doing a simulation lab, I would also have a double and encourage us to look at the ability to take the teacher ownership out of the classroom space itself, because what that will do is that will allow you to do less square footage with higher usage in the classrooms. So if you look at traditional environments where in a middle school, high school, for example, where you're scheduling, where a teacher owns a classroom, I'm a social studies teacher and I have this classroom. What happens in a traditional schedule is you utilize your spaces for about 75% of the time, 70% of the time. When you take the teacher ownership out of the classroom, do it like a landing space, and then allow teachers to float in and out of rooms as they use them, then that actually increases your capacity in those classrooms to about 90, 95%. So that's another way to encourage, you know, when you talk square footage per, per student, you know, based on the grade levels, um, that's a way to cut down the amount of square footage that you need, especially in middle school, high school, elementary. I'd love to keep us, you know, up in that larger range just because they need more room to spread out and they need more room to go off and, and read and things like that. But that's another way that you can work with square footage in a very creative and different way. Um, and then if I always like spaces too, that have the ability to, um, bring in the community and how can we use those spaces for community too? And oh my gosh, Craig, you are so, <laughs> I'm glad you said that, not me. Definitely. Um, the more involved the teachers, it, you know, you ask us what we want and we're going to tell you, we're not shy about that. <laughs> um, if you asked me to, to build my dream school, Craig, you'd probably be busy for a couple of years trying to build what I'd like. Um, but I, you know, I, I, again, be flexible in those spaces. The more we can encourage people to think a little differently and think about an us space and a we space instead of just mine, you know, you've got more ownership that happens with kids. You've got more ownership that happens with the spaces. And there are ways, you know, you'll have a, a language arts teacher say, but I've got book sets. Well, there's ways to get around that. A small closet can be converted to a book room give them a cart, have them bring in, bring in that. And one of the best questions that you can ask back to that teacher is how many of those book sets though, do you use on a daily basis? You know, can you just wheel those in and out of a, a shared space? So um, any other questions or anything, you're welcome to also jump off, you know, mute. You're more than welcome to do that. Unmuting the mic, Craig, is just on the bottom left-hand corner, you see a little microphone. Um, and then you can just click on that. Oh, you don't. Uh oh, Sebastian, can you unmute anybody? Oh, there we. Ah, oh, there, there we go. There we go. <laughs> there we go. Now finally, the mic pops up. I just wanted to one say thank you for what you said about that. We, I'm in uh, southwest corner of Utah. We're probably one of the two or three fastest growing places on the planet. Yes, you are. <laughs> as, fast as, as fast as we build them, they fill them up. And so we haven't had a time really to even sit down and design a new, a new elementary, for example. Mm -hmm. But we are doing a CT high school right now that we're really putting awesome. some serious effort into it because we're getting a lot of pressure from our communities. 
that we need kids, kid, we still need plumbers, we still need carpenters, we still need absolutely, auto we need all that kind of stuff, and it's just not working out in our traditional high schools. Mm-hmm. And so we did pass a bond, and, and but what I wanted to say is that we have we have selectively included a few teachers. Because I'm telling you, when you get to the teachers, and if you have to go to the public, all it does is increase size and oh, car yeah. and square footage. And we've also gone to the point um, uh, where we're where we're not a classroom is going to be a landing space. We're we're building a plaza of offices for t- it's almost like a university. We're saying, you know what? Oh, this I love it. Here's your desk. Here's your office. But here's your landing space. But it's love a totally it. different train of thought we're doing down here. Um, trying to meet this demand because we're so overwhelmed with people. Mm-hmm. I mean, I just we I just finished an elementary school uh, about two weeks ago that'll open in the fall, and I've already started another one because this one's full. Wow! Wow! I don't know where people and and when you were talking about where are there, they coming oh, from, Craig? <laughs> no, I don't know. Them. I think what happens is that when anything happens in California. They sprint to Southern Utah. That's true. That is true. We we have all the national parks and we've got all that kind of stuff and it's a great area and we golf year round. Um, and I know there's some other people on there from Utah, from up from Salt Lake up 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 mm-hmm. north. And I think the thing that's the biggest challenge, we we live in a time where you talked about a bond election. We had a hundred only a small one, hundred and eighty five million dollar bond with. Um, no tax increase, zero. Wow. And we only passed it by 1,800 votes out of 80,000 votes. Wow. I mean, I've never seen a more anti-environment. And we have, and and I, and I yes, I am, I ho- and I hope all three of you aren't from California, but I'm picking on them because that's who we get this influx of retirees. Sure. And they are anti, anti-anything education. And so we're hanging on by the skin of our teeth. Mm-hmm. And as the guys from up north can tell you too in Utah, if you look at the WPU, we're like dead last and we're constantly struggling to find that. So we're, we're trying to make yeah. space. And I'm not a, I'm not a salesman for this dirt, but if you really want to see something interesting, just look at, just Google dirt and look at some of the things that they've been able to do with space. And yeah. that's what got us on it because we don't know 15 years down the road that 40 by 40 classroom might need to be, really? might need to be 30 by 20 or 50 by 80. We don't know. And we, and, and you know, when you start taking down walls and electrical and all that, but it's really an interesting technology. But anyway, thanks for your help. I really appreciate oh my gosh, it. Of course. And I would tell you, you know, again, I think you guys are smart to make sure that you're involving small numbers, you know, um, because when you get too many, the other thing that I would do is really encourage you guys as you're doing the planning you know, have a small group, a steering group that is from the community and those leaders in those groups, especially if you deal with a lot of retirees, because what they really need to see. So the older generations need to see, well, that's kind of scary because I feel like I'm one of those older generations now. But um, one of the things that's important to them is to show relevance. So when you're involving the community, really showing them how is this going to benefit us as a community? You know, if I'm a retiree, why in the world do I want Craig working on this, you know, high school that's going to do this, this, and this? They don't necessarily think that technology is the right answer, but what we need to show is how those kiddos going out into the workforce can support them as a generation. That is extremely, extremely important. And so I think, right here. I think we've, we've taken the stand that, you know, um, with 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 some of these communities that that you want all the services mm-hmm. and you need we we need those people to provide those services Absolutely. but but and you've and and you know you've got to support this and and when you drive by a school all we get beat up on is uh, why are the football field lights on or, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or why are we building these Taj Mahals and yet we're doing it for yeah. under two hundred dollars a square foot. You know, wow. down, yeah. I mean, we're, we we we've worked our tails off to try to do this, and just wow. to, and just as a final thing, and I'll shut up. No, you're um, fine. I've been in my position for 13 years. Prior to that, I was a high school principal, but then <gasps> a principal and a teacher. So I didn't know a yard of concrete from a yard <laughs> of dirt, and I really didn't need to because mm-hmm. I had people around me. Yep. But I think what's happened, I knew the practical application. And so you surround yourself with good people and you get a good architect and you get these good IT people and you surround yourself with good people 
And it's amazing what you can come up with. It's just trying to convince a school board. Yeah. Because they're really not pro, most school boards are really not pro change, at least in our state. They're just, they don't rock the boat and try to get them. I mean, we're taking a huge step by doing a CT high school. Huge. But anyway, thank you again, and I'll be quiet. Oh, of course. Oh, my gosh, Craig. No worries at all. And I, you know, one thing that I definitely, and and I would encourage all of you, if you're working with school boards, especially right now, you know, all of these school boards are all virtual. I'm more than happy to share this Generation Z, um, you know, obviously taking out a little bit of the architect stuff because they won't necessarily want that. But I'm more than happy to share this with a school board. Because I think the more education that you can bring to someone, and again, like Craig said, bring that relevance to them and show them, you know, why this is important, the better off it is. And I think it is tough when you've got a really traditional, um, you know, older retired community, that is hard for them to see 20 and 30 years in the future, because they might be 70 years old going, I'm not going to be around in 30 years, you know, so I like to, to teach them about why these kids need this and how they can help leave a legacy for that next generation. And that's extremely important. You know, I think the older generation definitely wants to be able to leave the, you know, leave their community better than they found it. So I think that's so important. Um, and Dan and I, yeah, I, I'm with you. I can agree with Craig's comments, right? A hundred percent. And Craig, how cool that you're a retired principal. There are some other crazy people in this world, aren't there? Uh, thank you guys. Any other questions? Feel free to unmute. You're more than welcome to do that. ECDO and so I'm just I'm just interested in where you're at. I am in Colorado. Oh, in Colorado. Yep. I'm about an hour north of Denver. In um, a little I'm in Loveland. Loveland. Okay. Yeah, I'm in Loveland. So about 10 minutes south of Fort Collins. And um, I grew up on the central coast of California on Vandenberg Air Force Base. I'm sorry. <laughs> You know, being on the Air Force Base was wonderful. Uh, my dad. Well, Air Force Base is great. It's the California side because, <laughs> oh my gosh, every time every time something happens, we just get inundated. The earthquakes and fires in San Diego when they had those. That's we true. Inundated. Everybody just. But I was going to tell you, you know, finally, sometimes the the real challenge that I've had is 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 trying to reason with people that you can't reason with. I mean, I had a guy scream at me literally scream at me on the street when we announced we were building this high school in this big alfalfa field. And he said that to me. He said, if this was California, that would never happen. And I said, maybe you ought to go back to California. I mean, I didn't know what else to say to the guy. And he says, we were promised it would be an alfalfa field. And I said, what do you think you're living in? You're living in an old alfalfa field. But we just, but we just couldn't reason with them. We finally just had, I just had to say, look, we're just going to have to agree to disagree because the kids are here and we've got to have a facility and this is the way it is. And if you want to sell your house and move, I guess that's your, you know, your prerogative, but it's, it's become really a huge challenge in our state as far as building facilities. It really, really has been a hard deal, but it's been worthwhile. I mean, it's been part of this part of my career, I, I would say. And if we had more time, I could tell you some other things. But anyway, <laughs> thank you. I've got to okay. thank you so thank you. much. Well, thank you. Craig, I, I, um, this is Emily here. I will follow up with you, actually. I think you would um, find it interesting. We're actually installing next month at a massive CT high school. I'd love to show you what we did there. Where at? Um, it's actually in Texas, uh, and it's really, really exciting. I have some stuff that I can show you. Can I just ask you, where in Texas? Yeah, in Crowley, Texas. Where's that? Kind of outside of Dallas. Mm-hmm. Okay. We, we we visited. We've sort of modeled ours after um, uh, we went down and visited one south of Houston in Pasadena, uh, which was a re- pretty amazing a pretty amazing yeah. program. We, 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 I guess we stole some ideas from them, but... <laughs> Yeah, I've, and I've got a son that lives just north of Dallas in McKinney is why I'm asking. So, And Craig, if you want to see those other, the school that I was speaking about, you're more yeah. than welcome to email me and I'm more than happy to to show you some of those designs too because they're, they're a lot of fun, very different. Mm-hmm. We've spent well, in a lot fact, of time. anyone looking for inspiration, look no further. Email any of us, uh, Sue yeah. Ann, Sebastian, myself. We have examples of really, really cool showcase stu- schools that we've done across the country. So do you have my email, Emily, it's Craig. Do you, do you, do you have I my do. email? Okay. I so email. email. I that way we can talk back and forth. For and sure. Second, and, 
And Sharon, um, I'd love to answer your question. You know, can you unmute for me and tell me a little bit more um, related to the nursing students? Talk to me a little bit about that. Well, hello. Hi. <laughs> Hi yeah, just even before COVID-19, um, mm -hmm. in my experience, um, young girls, young women who are studying nursing are very different from others. They're a much more homogeneous group. Mm -hmm. uh, they're not so specialized. They're more generalist. Um, so that was always my perspective of that personality profile. And then now after COVID-19, <laughs> I suppose they're angels, <gasps> uh, warriors, whatever you want to call. But just, you know, any thoughts that you might have about the environment for supporting nursing? Well, learning? and I, boy, I couldn't agree with you more as far as, you know, the warrior piece. I think one of the things that I've noticed, I've got several friends in the nursing field and the um, my husband actually, uh, right before he became a police officer, was a paramedic for a lot of years in the Navy. And, um, you know, one thing I notice about healthcare is they either have that innate ability to be that warrior, or it's something that's kind of brought out in them. So I think that one of the biggest things that I would encourage, just because of having to learn bedside manner and having to really work with multiple people, is again, any of those environments that really encourage that teamwork, that discussion, that, um, you know, kind of pushing them in that way to, you can't be on your own, can't be on an island, you've got to be asking, you've got to be talking to people. So um, I think, I think that's really important. Um, but I, again, I would say that that's so important for all of this generation of kiddos, because they really, when you grow up, like this, you have a really hard time learning this. So I, you know, when I go in and actually teach teachers, one of the things that we do at Meteor, which is the reason that I came to a furniture company as an educator, um, is I, I can go out and teach teachers how to do that because it, you guys can put these great, pretty environments in and we can come in and furnish those beautiful environments. And if teachers aren't taught and supported in how to teach, then things tend to go back into straight rows. So, I, you know, really going in and helping support the education side, you know, we like to say that we're not just a furniture company, we're an education solutions company. And so when you're creating your solution for the physical environment, you know, really you've got to have that partner to come in and help bring the teachers along. And I think that the easiest way to start that conversation, Sharon, is at the very beginning. Again, going back to what are your intents? What is your instructional vision? You know, how do you plan to get there? Because you'll pick up on things that when you just ask them, you go straight to the environment on what is the stuff you want to put in here? And we skip over function. So we've got to know what the function is of the space, and then we can build that, that ability. Um, so again, I think it's, that's so important. I think it goes even beyond just nursing, but I would definitely, one of the biggest things I can do is encourage all of you, if you're doing high schools to help partner, you know, help districts partner with, with, uh, community colleges around and getting, bringing those nursing programs, the CNA programs into the schools because the that's more very kids, helpful Sue Ann. thank you oh, you're so welcome i think it's important to get kids exposed to those things you know because they may or may not if they weren't growing up around that field they may not know it even exists and they right. may find a hidden passion so encouraging kids to explore you know and again learn together is super important thank you so much absolutely absolutely and oh dan and how cool that you're I'll, Craig, did you see Dannon's uh, piece about a CTE building in the Davis School District that you might want to check out? That's awesome. I'm so happy you guys are sharing resources. That's wonderful. Yeah, I just, I just, it, it just popped in, which is awesome. Um, which we're doing a, a CT high school over in, it's a little town called Hilldale. And if I said the name Warren Jeffs, I think all of you would know what <laughs> 
and we had to resurrect that community over there, which has been a great success story. But anyway, yeah, thank you. Schools, I think it's important. You know, I think one of the greatest things that you guys can bring to the table right now is revitalizing schools being the center of a community and the hub of the community. So that's that's awesome. And how cool, Dan, that you did the interior design that. Oh, awesome. <laughs> I love I love the connections that you guys are making. So this is wonderful. Any anyone else have any other questions? You're welcome to unmute. All right, Sebastian, I'll hand it back over to you then. Thank you, Sue Ann. Great presentation. And we would like to thank you for your attendance and for your participation. Great questions, great commentary going on. Um, just a few reminders. Uh, we, if you are looking uh, for um, a completion, you know, like your AIA credit for having attended. If you did put that on your Zoom when you registered the first time, then we have that on file. If you're not sure or you didn't put it, please feel free to reach out for one of us so that we can give you your proper credit for your attendance. Um, if you would like a certificate of completion that is also available. And uh, we do have a recording um, of this webinar that we will send out uh, once it's been edited, if you would like to watch it again, or if you would like it to share it with other colleagues. And uh, here at Meteor Education, we have a variety of other courses that we also offer on different subjects. If you would like to bring those to your, uh, you know, to your office or to some of your other colleagues, we would be more than welcome to um, more than happy, I mean, <laughs> to bring those over to you. So if that is all, um, thank you for your attendance and we hope to see you again thank soon. Thank you guys. Thank you so much for today.